Hello, and welcome to AdAge's custom webcast, sponsored by Redpoint Global. The topic of today's webcast is the data and analytics behind a personalized customer experience. I'm Christopher Hosford with the AdAge team, and we have just a few items to go over before we begin. We'll hear from today's presenters, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. So to participate in the Q&A portion of the webcast, all you have to do is type your question into the Ask a Question text area, and then click the Send button. You can submit the questions at any time during the webcast to one or all of our presenters for today, and we'll address as many of them as time permits after our presenters' prepared remarks. Now let's get started. I'd like to introduce our first presenter for today, John Nash is Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer at Redpoint Global. John has spent his career helping businesses grow revenue through the application of advanced technologies, analytics, and business model innovations. John is responsible for developing new markets, launching new solutions, building brand awareness, generating pipeline growth, and advancing thought leadership. John, it's all yours, so take it away. Great, thanks, Chris. Excited to be with everybody today. I'm going to set the stage for what data and analytic capabilities you need to drive that personalized CX and how to do it in a way that drives superior outcomes, superior revenue, response, profitability. Uh, and that's why I'm joined today also by three of my colleagues. Uh, they're experts in their respective spaces. Um, and so Steve Zisk is going to go through some of those how to's uh, and the capabilities around data. Bill Porto is going to do it around analytics and uh, AI and machine learning. And RF Norudi is going to bring the data and analytics together and show you how that we impact the customer experience and, and orchestrate interactions across channels and, and do it that way. So I uh, look forward to connecting with all three of those as we go through the presentation today. Thank you again to everybody for joining us. Um, we'd like to start with uh, a quote from the 1880s. So I'm going to go back in time a little bit, but um, it's always the simple that produces the marvelous. And I hope that we give you some ideas today and some simple things you can do to create marvelous experiences. Um, I'm also just finished uh, uh, reading a book on Thomas Edison. It was a biography by Edmund Morris. Uh, great, great insights into the history of the incandescent light and other things, but. The incandescent light was preceded by an arc light. Uh, here's a picture of it. In the early 1800s, they had an idea to use electricity to light up things instead of gas or candles. Um, there was a few faults with it, and as you can kind of tell by the picture, they weren't very safe. So there was a few problems, and Thomas Edison set out, of course, to improve that. We ended up with the incandescent light, uh, and it was really – it was – perfected over time by Thomas Edison through thousands of experiments. He did 6,000 experiments just to find the right filament. Uh, but he, for, he didn't only perfect the filament, he perfected the glass around it. He got the world's, one of the world's most renowned glass blowers from Germany to come and be the glass blower in the, in the R&D factory. Um, he perfected the atmosphere within the glass. He perfected the distribution of electricity uh, in, in so that the consumers didn't have to think at all about it other than turning a switch on or off. Um, so he really did perfect it. Um, he made it simple in that aspect of the consumers could just turn a switch on and off um, and by, by building the ecosystem around the light bulb. So Edison Electric was the first power supplier. They actually picked, of all places, Manhattan as the first city to light up, um, and they, they did it on an industrial scale right away. Uh, and they eventually, of course, lit up the world. So they really changed the world by doing it. And I think it'd be great if you thought through today's session in terms of how you're going to change your world, whatever your world is. Uh, what are the game changers for you? How are you perfecting your customer experience? How are you testing and tuning it? Uh, have you brought together the experts of your company? Like Edison brought together experts from many fields. He had chemical uh, scientists and Electronic, electric scientists and engineers, production and process engineers. So how, have you brought together the data and analytics and marketing operations experts in ways to, to really improve things? And how are you building your power supply to really fuel your marketing ideas? So I challenge you to think through some of that today as we go through this. Uh, the imperative clearly 
is for brands to compete on the strength of CX today. Uh, products have been commoditized, so now we've got to understand what our consumers' intents are. We've got to understand the context of what they're engaging us with, and we need to understand their cadence. And of course, you do all this through data. And so there's a data foundation that allows us to do this, and then ultimately, we want to deliver the most relevant offer or message or next best action, whatever it is, in the context and cadence of the consumer. That requires machine learning and, and AI to really do that at a, a personalized level of one. Uh, and so we're going to get into some of the discussions today on how to do this. Um, clearly, though, experiences are changing. They've changed dramatically over the last year in terms of multi-channel experiences, the need for real-time experiences, the need for real-time and dynamic experiences. Uh, so we, we've, we really recognize that we've got to create and market to a mass audience of one. And consumers are now expecting it and they're demanding it. We did some research with Harris Poll, uh, this is a little over a year ago, that said that 73% of consumers say brands are not meeting their expectations for personalized omnichannel experiences. So that's a big gap. We've done some industry-specific surveys. Uh, we found this gap is pre prevalent in healthcare, financial services, retail. Uh, there's some nuances between those segments, but really there's a big gap out there. I think probably a lot of us on the phone recognize that gap. Um, and we also, but we at Redpoint recognize that the data and technology exists today to change this. And we as marketers can go from broad segments to individual segments of one in a way that the journeys are dynamic, multi-event, multi-stage, multi-channel. Um, they're highly personalized in the context and cadence of the consumer. In fact, real-time, if not event-driven across the customer life cycle in, in a true, not only personalized way, but personalized and omnichannel. So it's consistently personalized across all of the channels that your consumers might to engage, choose to engage with you on. And when we do these things, uh, we work with a lot of clients across a lot of industries. The dividends are worth it. Um, this is a chart uh, from Gartner that's, that illustrates the, the outcomes you can get if your data maturity goes up or the capabilities you have around dealing with data go up, as well as the enterprise usage of that data across touch points, which is the access, the horizontal access here. And we see that if you go from a product-centric set of capabilities to organization-centric, where you're maybe um, looking at uh, historical transaction or the value of a consumer to the company, um, there's a little bit of lift, 3% lift in response rates, potentially. If you go to persona-centric or segment-centric, you might get a 6% lift. Ultimately, if you go to customer-centric, where you're looking at behavioral data and usage and um, sentiments across first, second, third-party data, anonymous and known journeys, you get upwards of a 20% lift in response rates. And this is where I'm going to focus a lot of our energy today, is the capabilities to get that type of lift. And we've done that with a number of clients. We've, in fact, exceeded that lift with a number of our clients. But there's some themes around the, one, the clients that are most ambitious and that are achieving these outcomes. And the themes are around, I'd say, these five core capabilities, being able to connect all of your data, being able to forge a golden record about each individual consumer, being able to pinpoint next best actions, being able to intelligently orchestrate that across all of your channels and ultimately delivering the compelling marketing moment in a way that you're measuring each step of this and you're measuring responses and that becomes a data point that you learn and optimize against your business objectives. So this closed loop is also an important aspect of the capabilities. And I'd say, and again, this is not theoretical for us. <laughs> We've deployed these capabilities and found these commonalities across a wide range of brands, uh, leading brands in the world, really uh, from e-commerce or digital first com focused companies like GoDaddy and SoFi and 1-800-CONTACTS to some of the largest retail and consumer packaged goods brands uh, in the world. Uh, some of the largest financial services, travel and hospitality, healthcare brands. Uh, we've also done work, they're not all represented here, but we've done work with um, also ambitious brands. So maybe brands that don't have as much renown as some of these. Uh, one of those comes up is Avashan Hardware. Avashan Hardware is a regional hardware retailer um, based in the Northeast. They've got over 100 stores, but they they aspire to compete against 
big box retailers and others, and they know there's a lot of competitors for their consumers. Um, and they're using our capabilities, and uh, they're a brand that's been around since 1908. So uh, they're a long storied brand as well. So, and with some of those, um, as an example, we've gotten quite a few different ROI levers. It depends on what you want to move your levers on, um, but we've increased uh, or reduced operating expenses and increased profitability over 8% by simply connecting all the data in ways that have very accurate matching, so we're not undermatching or overmatching consumers. We've improved FTE by up to 80% around things like data scientists, uh, the data analysts bringing the data together, the, the IT resources, the marketing operations resources, uh, and getting really highly granular in your segmentation while doing that. We've increased response rates on converting real-time next best actions up to 79% increase in, in conversion rates, up to 25% increase in response rates around orchestrating intelligently across all your channels, and we've driven revenue growth uh, over 19%. We've got several examples above that. Um, that would be happy to get you any examples if you want to after this webinar, but th there are results that come from this is my main point there. Um, there are a lot, a lot of hurdles between those outcomes and where you might be today. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on the hurdles because I think you've all, you're all, all dealt with these, but our channels and data are exploding and prolifer proliferating. Our MarTech stacks are fragmented. The customer journeys are becoming more complex all the time, and now they're changing. Consumer behaviors are changing rapidly. The technology, the engagement channels are changing rapidly. And then we also have this pressure, um, both from regulators around privacy compliance, as well as just from the consumers themselves that we have to deal with. So we're, we're solving our, this problem and overcoming these barriers in the, in, in the same way to really transform our customer experiences and seal this gap that exists between experience and expectations and strategy and execution to ultimately create interactions and moments that make a difference to the consumers and the perfect in the eyes of the consumer. So right now, um, it is possible to create brand experience exactly as you intend them to, regardless of the channel, as perfect as your customers expect them, through the capabilities that are, for us, represented by RG1. It's a software platform that's integrated data analytics and orchestration. But I'm going to talk not so much about our software per se, but about the capabilities required, regardless of you, if you use our software or not, to do these things well. Uh, it begins foundationally with customer data management, um, taking every bit of data you have, whether it's batch or streaming, integrating it into a consistent and precise view of each consumer or the golden record, as we refer to it. From that, being able to use that data through an automated machine learning mechanism to offer the next best message or offer a product in the context or cadence of the customer at the speed of the customer that matches real-time journeys that now customers demand, and ultimately then orchestrate these interactions across the entire stack that you have and across uh, all engagement channels in real time, which is important for things like um, buy online, pick up in store, where we're getting this merging of real time and in store experience, or digital and in store experience um, together. And ultimately, um, that gives you having capabilities in these three areas, it's possible to get a single point of control over data and operations, which is critical to delivering the types of experiences and closing that gap. Uh, and we do, you know, we work on all those hard things and, and all the complexity. Uh, talked about Thomas Edison's team. Um, we've kind of simplified a lot of the difficulty around working with data and the analytics and orchestration. So you as a marketer can focus more on the creative, more on creating your journeys that you want to, more on t testing and tuning and optimizing those over time and ultimately um, making possible all the perfect things that you've got in your head of what you want to do as a marketer. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Zesk, who's going to go through some of those data capabilities. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, do a quick switch because we have the new set of slides available. There we go. So let me start by talking about uh, the four different capabilities of data that are extremely important for, for meeting the requirements and making the hard things look beautiful and possible and doing the amazing journey that 
um, John was just talking with us about. The first of those is that we need to be able to handle all data, not just digital customer uh, touch points. So uh, many of the, the solutions that are out in the MarTech space today are very good at their specific channels, but there's a tremendous amount of data that's locked up inside various kinds of enterprise systems. Some of the obvious ones are things like notes inside a CRM, service details that might be part of a uh, service ticket, uh, uh, patient diagnosis that might be part of a healthcare uh, uh, electronic notes system. All of those kinds of things contribute to an understanding of who the customer is and what the customer journey is. Secondly, we should realize that not every detail that we care about for the customer's experience and customer journey is a piece of customer data. There's particularly all kinds of data, both in the enterprise and outside the enterprise, that may inform uh, a low friction journey for customers, things like product data, locational data, weather, IOT, all kinds of different bits and pieces of data that inform how the customer is, is expected to act, react, what they might be looking for. Second point I'd like to make is that you need to be able to handle data quality, both data cleansing, normalization, and match merge across customer records and relationships and so on or in order to be able to understand customer behaviors across their touch points, understand the relationship between the customer and other people, organizations, devices, householding, and so on. The third point that I would make is that all of this has to happen in the context of computing and aggregating a bunch of different details about the customer across multiple different sources and over time. So customer journeys are not just about what's happening right now. What's happening right now is the culmination of a whole collection of bits of information about the customer that have to be brought to bear to understand what the customer is actually trying to do. Um, last point that I would make is that all of this has to happen in real time with low latency at whatever scale is required in order to produce the kinds of use cases and meet the customer requirements that they might have for their customer experiences and to match their requirements, their needs, their expectations with what we're doing as an organization to try to meet our goals, to try to make the customer experience low friction and so on. These use cases include things like the ability to analyze marketing segments. This is kind of classic marketing use cases. What do my segments look like? How does a particular customer fit into that segment? What does a customer journey look like? What is the offer going to look like that will meet that customer's expectations? But there are other kinds of use cases for a single customer view as well. One of those is a use case that's outside the realm of marketing to recognize that, that uh, a single customer view may be used in contexts like customer service. A customer wants to make a return. Do we know what item they're they bought recently? Do we know why they might want to make a return? Do we know whether we have stock on a different size if they're looking for that? So being able to look up customer profiles in a contact center or in a call center and determine what the action should be based on what the customer is doing and meet the customer with a uh, relevant experience and potentially even with a relevant offer. And then finally, we should recognize that not all experiences are digital experiences. We're in a very digital age right now, but customers are eventually going to want to be able to get back to different kinds of in-store and in-person experiences. And we want to be able to create single customer views that provide the information, whether it's product recommendations, size information, uh, you might also like all kinds of different things that we might be able to say to customers based on our knowledge of the customer, our knowledge of products, and of, of inventory and other kinds of details. Um, one last point I'd make before I finish up here is that 
these are some pretty obvious and sort of above board and, and visible use cases where you're actually looking at the single customer view itself, there's a whole collection of invisible use cases for a single customer view as well, ranging from how do I build out segments behind the scenes in order to understand who my customers are to um, how do I analyze the customer journey in such a way that I can recognize places where it's failing and go again behind the scenes and try to fix things. So a single customer view is useful across a pretty broad range of use cases where you're actually looking at the view and an even broader range of use cases behind the scenes where it's used for other kinds of interactions with the customer. Great, thanks Steve. If you could you go back a couple of slides to that data capability slide and before we get into the AI and machine learning capabilities, I had a couple things uh, that I wanted to ask you about on this slide. Yes, um, absolutely. So the real time real time aggregation layer at the top. Why, from a marketer perspective, why is real time data aggregation important? Well, the core of this is understanding the customer journey. There's all kinds of valuable aggregate data that you can put together based on essentially a time series or a collection of points. So uh, things like recency, frequency, and monetary value based on purchase history or based on um, uh, visit history, understanding web path and dwell time for understanding what a customer is doing in a session at the moment, uh, being able to calculate or at least guess product affinity, but you need to put all of those kinds of session details in context with everything else we know about customers and products that we may already have, and you need to be able to do that at the same cadence as the customer who's moving around in digital space right here and now. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So I can get like a dynamic lifetime value uh, calculated here as the consumer changes what they do. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay, and then there's a lot of complexity both in the real-time aggregation, but just in real-time um, data integration, matching, you've got real-time identity layer. Um, you know, why do markers need to do real-time at all? Well, the We're core of this, that's a, I understand that. That's a, the core of this is, is that consumers expect a frictionless experience. And it's one thing to say, I'm going to look at what's happening in session at this moment and make a relevant experience in a web environment or in a mobile environment based on the web data, data and mobile data I have right here. But if you're looking for relevance and responsiveness and sort of trying to understand um, what's informing what a customer is doing, then you need to be able to respond to the combination of all of the data up to the moment. So uh, it's no good to know what a customer is doing in a session right now if I don't know that they already purchased an item that they're looking at yesterday. If I do know that they purchased an item that they're looking at yesterday, then that might inform me about what they're actually doing right now is looking for an item to go along with it or trying to understand ship date or other kinds of things. And this becomes even more important in the context of the fact that we've moved so much to digital channels and that movement sort of advanced a, a quick decade in six months in response to the pan pandemic. And that's just pushed us way forward in the need for real time across both the data layer, the analytics layer, and the actual orchestration of the experience. Great. Okay, and then some of these data sources are more difficult than others, uh, like streaming data, behavior data. You know, what are the use cases that benefit from that, from those types of data? Well, some obvious examples in, in 2021 kinds of customer journeys require uh, details of the journey in the moment. What am I doing right now? Where am I in relationship to a store or service? So if I've got a mobile device and I'm in, in relationship with a brand and I'm providing some information at that, that brand, uh, what should the brand do when I actually show up at a store? Maybe it's time to send a message that says, we see you have an order. We see you've arrived at the store. Would you like us to deliver the order curbside to your car? Maybe it's that uh, I've taken my car out on a sunny day after lousy, snowy weather, 
and what I'm really looking for is, wouldn't you like to come to our car wash right now? And based on things like what's the weather condition, what's your drive time to the car wash, um, uh, is the car wash operational and working right now and have availability, um, those kinds of bits of information might affect my offers or experience. And those are all data that's happening in the moment from multiple different kinds of devices that has to be brought together and tied to my customer record. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, let's switch gears now to Bill, um, who's going to take us through some of the machine learning and AI capabilities. And Bill, uh, I think you may have to advance a couple slides to get caught up here, but over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, talk a little about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, machine learning is actually one of the biggest things coming through now that actually can look at the data, figure out what's going on, and allow you to use it instead of making a lot of assumptions about what's going on. And there are basically three tenets that I see that pertain to all of this in terms of using machine learning and other techniques like this that help you be successful. And the first of these, again, in any sort of learning system, you got to be able to predict. And so if you can predict, then you can utilize that prediction to drive marketing decisions and message your customers optimally. And then finally, um, you know, actually put it into place and do something with it. Optimization and adaptation, those are huge. The optimization part's often overlooked, specifically because you know, people go to school and they learn different modeling techniques and then they apply them in their work. And they figure out, okay, well, I used this before, I'm going to use this again, and therefore it must be the optimal way to do it. Well, maybe there are different types of models or different configurations, and this is where optimization is highly important to find out what works for you today with that particular data, which may change tomorrow, so it might require a different algorithm or a different configuration or initialization, et cetera. And again, the adaptation part, and this is huge as well, because again, the world doesn't remain static for any period of time whatsoever. It's always dynamic. You have to be able to adapt to that, and that's where you need to have this automation system in there. The automation part, again, you don't have typically enough manpower or time to create the modeling and the, the different parts of the puzzle. So you want to be able to make sure that you can do this in a fast, timely manner to get what you need to be done and also do it much more efficiently. A lot of people also think about machine learning as it taking over for jobs. It actually doesn't. It basically it's an enabling technique. It allows you to do your job more efficiently, get more out of the actual data, and use it effectively um, to, to help your customer base. So in terms of doing all of this, we take a, a, a system, an integrated system approach to this. And I think this is a big key to making sure that you have a good, successful machine learning system. And the first part of this always is, is the old, uh, you know, the, the data pre-processing, making sure that you have the data available, um, get rid of the noise in it, uh, all the curation, the join, getting all your data available to do what you need to do with respect to learning systems. You need to be able to rapidly model. Um, at this point in time, we don't have the capabilities to, to um, use a typical, you know, in our client base we've seen people actually say, it takes six weeks for an IT department or a data scientist department to come up with a model. Well, that may be just too, too, too late. And it's not really keeping up with the pace of life these days where you need to have rapid modeling changes for season changes for everything else and be able to adapt to that. Another thing, again, post-processing. What do you do with the results? Now, you think about machine learning as giving you predictions of what to do, but now how to do that and do it in an efficient, in a, uh, efficient manner is very important. So this is where post-processing comes in. And it may be where you have a dozen different recommendations, but which of those are you going to actually expose to and message your customers with? Um, do you take the top five out of something and put them into a carousel, or do you actually do some of the post-processing and find out, gee, this customer has already bought that product that was already recommended to them. You're not going to pre present that again. So take maybe uh, number two, three, four, and five, and six. So that gives you a better outlook on, on uh, what you can do for your customers. And again, as I mentioned before, the automation part here is, is key. If you can make the automation systemic, then you can do a one button. Here's the, your ease of repeatability that allows you to do much more in a much more efficient uh, manner. A little bit about data. This is regardless of whether you're using machine learning or not. It's, it's all about the information and the data. So again, data is not the same as information, and that's, that is one thing that people don't seem to understand. They just collect a lot of stuff that may not be pertinent whatsoever. So the old garbage in, garbage out comes in there. 
And I like to take a different, almost a psychological view of this in terms of when you collect data. I like to think about the stimulus response pairs. So the message is the stimulus, and that's what you show. That's the content and the font and the placement, um, how often you do this. And then you figure out what the response is. And then that response can be used then as a feedback cycle to say, you did well or you didn't do well and you need to change something. So in terms of machine learning, um, there are a couple different basic classes that are pertinent to almost all of the marketing segments of the marketing world. The first of these I call what they call supervised learning. This is where you've got historical data, you've collected it over some period of time, and you have all the stimuli. Those are the the you know the things that you did per se. And you also have correlated outputs. What is the truth? What happened when you did this, whatever the this is? So you send out a bunch of messages and you have maybe the demographics and other pieces of information, and the customer responded, they didn't respond, or they responded in a different way. So that's what we call supervised learning. And that's where you want to do maybe classification. You know, is, is this something that we can say this is class one, class two, or are they retained, or are they you know, a candidate for attrition, et cetera. Uh, the other possibility is basically clustering or segmentation. I use those synonymously because they basically are. This is what we call unsupervised learning. So you have historical data, but you may not have, or more importantly, a lot of times, you don't necessarily trust the associated outputs that you have. So you want to find what's similar and what's dissimilar, and then use that similarity information then to target the customer base more personally instead of lumping everybody together. And that's a very powerful technique that can be used. But here's one possible use of machine learning. Again, we've seen a lot of, of businesses use this in a very effective and efficient manner. And this is where you want to do some sort of segmentation and optimal messaging based on that segmentation. So one of the ideas here is, again, is that you can find who is similar or dissimilar when you collect the data. And again, thinking about the stimulus response part. And let the data speak for itself. So in terms of the typical um, presumptive type of segmentation where you have well, maybe the age groups are 20 to 25 and 26 to 40 and et cetera, let the data speak for itself. Find out what actually is important within the data instead of making assumptions that may not be valid. So then after you get the data, you run some machine learning, you get the various segments, you've labeled them. The biggest question here is then why is somebody in a specific segment and what makes them different than people in a different segment? Because then you can get the insight into your messaging and what you, specifically within those messages will drive your customers. So here's a possibility, and this is again, not just using a single machine learning technique, but multiple ones, is to actually chain them together, do one into another, so that you can get additional insight. So in this case, we're showing, you take a basic clustering and segmentation model, and that gives you labels. So you've already now said, I've got the similarities, who's going what cluster and you put the labels on them, cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, but you want to find out what, what the information is inside those clusters, the why, why someone was put into that. So here's something, chain and decision tree on the output of that. So that now that you have the labels, you can then get the if then else rules, and then you can map the offers and products to those specific customers. And it's a very, power, very, very powerful approach. So here's an example of a very simple data-driven um, um, customer chain in terms of a, uh, a segmentation approach that's put through a, a, a rule-based uh, decision tree. And what you can see here is that after the labels were put on them, you then you can actually figure out, well, what was the actual demographic makeup of who went in what specific cluster and what did the outcome happen to be on that? So therefore, you can then say, well, for this particular set of age, um, geographics, um, all the different demographic information that you have, and then you can say, well, I'm going to set this message to, to that particular customer because I know that they're in this specific segment and they were actually responsive. And that way you can personalize the information and it makes use of the data instead of making the assumptions that are often erroneous. So in, in terms of um, doing this chaining, there's another possibility as well to increase your success rates is, um, again, talking about uh, basic offer recommendation systems out there. Well, if you have information that, you know, what, what happened in terms of the customer's past, you can also expand their horizons. 
So we've had the you know, carousel approach where the customer recommendations are, here's the first five things, but if the customer's been buying the same thing over and over again, you don't necessarily have to recommend that same thing to them. So maybe they've been drinking um, you know, and ordering a specific type of latte. Well, offer a different type of coffee products in that case. And that expands their horizons and also expands the customer base and also what their um, product base is for you. So one of the things too is you can actually use model chaining to do this and make it even better in addition to that. And Steve mentioned that you know if you had just purchased something or went to a website and said, okay, well, um, you know, I saw this, I bought this, and now um, the next day I see products advertised for the identical things I just purchased, that's, that's a waste of time. And it also a waste of your consumer experience. So one thing you can do is actually you can use model chaining here to take a look at not just what the offers are, but actually what the, the channel, the best channel to use, and also the periodicity. How often should you show that particular message to the customer and or show them different types of messages? It's a very powerful approach where you don't use just one single machine learning technique, but you chain them together. So in terms of a systemic approach, and this is a very, very important part here, is to make this a very easy to use, complete end-to-end -end system. And this is where, again, where you have fast modeling capabilities. You can build the models, you train them, you use machine learning, all, all in the same processes. And in the background, you have continuous optimization. And that's where you want to make sure that you don't stop the learning process. You make sure that all of this is done in the background as well, so that after you have your messaging and you have those models being used, in the background, you're constantly learning new things. And as you're learning these things, again, um, you can then implement those as they come online as you need to. Maybe you have a new set of records come in, and it's a very powerful thing. And this is where you actually want to make sure that the responses to the information get put in that database so that you can reuse and relearn. And when you do that, then you have a closed feedback loop. And this is, this is one of the highest of importance. So you don't want to just do something and not learn from it. You want to do something, figure out how well you did, and adapt to that so you can do something in the future that's even better. Thanks, Bill. Um, this is great. And I, I got a couple questions on this slide. I got a question about adaptation, but I think we'll have to save that for another webinar. It might be a topic by itself. Um, but the model of building and machine learning to model deployment, you talked about that being a seamless process. But can you give me a sense of what the some of the compression times are or other benefits of making that a seamless process? Absolutely. Um, we have seen many of our clients state that it just takes too long to make this a, a um, easy to use and fast and rapid modeling uh, technique. And what they do is they tip, the typical approach is they go to a, a data scientist team and they get, you know, here's my request for a set of models. They come back with the models weeks later and by then the data is often stale. And because it's stale, you're dealing with stuff that is not necessarily pertinent. So by making this a seamless process, you can do it almost like a one button thing after you've gone ahead and configured it. So you find out what you want to do, configure it once, and you automate the process so that maybe in the background the data is automatically being collected and then on some period or maybe on an event based you've got another 10,000 records or another 100,000 records it automatically retrains in the background and you don't have to do much other than just monitor it and say oh I like this this is doing well or I'm going to tweak it a little bit here and there okay and there's also this seamless connection between what marketers do and what data scientists do are you trying to make it seamless um, where, where marketers can specify their business objectives and have the analytics kind of trigger against those. Um, you know, which of those two roles are both kind of in uh, high demand? Which ones are most critical to focus on? They're actually both. Um, again, this, the machine learning tools uh, are not basically going to replace anything. They're enablers. And we've seen actually if you were to give modeling uh, capabilities to marketers, they can actually do their job more efficiently and you know, they still can ask data scientists for help and guidance, but they don't have to necessarily replace them. They can actually do their job and do more things within their job. And on the other side, the data scientists, again, trying multiple models, um, doing it all manually is a very time consumption process. And so anything we can do to optimize that and make sure that the data chain from the raw data to the pre-processing, to the actual model creation and the evaluation, all that analytics, make that seamless, one touch stuff, and then they can go ahead and have a cup of coffee and do something in terms of uh, you know, better efficiency with their life as this is done on the computer in the background. Great. And then we talked about this kind of you know, optimization, and we've talked about closed loop 
uh, you know, closed loop between data analytics and actions and measuring that. You know, what's the role of machine learning specific to that loop? Actually, let me. That's a that's a good segue. Let me put up this slide. Um, this is where you can actually take a look at doing processes in the background and a constant feedback cycle here. So, for example, if you were to start with something that you have. Um, an existing process that you have to do some messaging. You can actually use that for a while as you gather data to do the machine learning. And in the background, what happens is that you know, the constant set of stimuli and responses are going back into the database and the models are being trained. And they're being trained over and over and over again on a day, day basis, but they're not necessarily being used until you have enough confidence in the model. Maybe it's enough data to support that particular model and that confidence. At that point, once you have that, then you can just flip the switch and say, instead of using the randomized approach or the current mechanism that you have, use the machine learning approach. And that then drives the same decisions that you would do normally by a manual mechanism. But as you do that, again, the, the stimulus and the response, that feedback cycle is constant. That never stops. Because everything that gets predicted and you put out the message, um, that's set out and you figure out what that response is. That closes the feedback cycle and then that allows you then to learn from what you did and allows you to have better messaging for your customer base. Great. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so let's go, uh, let's bring it home now with RF. If you could cover the, you know, using data and analytics to orchestrate these customer experiences in a high, highly personalized way, why don't you go ahead and take off with that, RF? You bet. Yeah, let's talk about, you know, for example, which orchestration capabilities are most important and why. So let's spend a few minutes around that. I'm going to be talking about uh, the consumer experience here on our Wellesley Outfitter a demo site. Um, then I'll be speaking about the uh, the data that that's really driving the uh, the journey and the experience of the consumer. And then finally, we'll take a look at you know what enables that from a single point of control. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a, take a look at the first slide here, the um, Wellesley Outfitter. Uh, this is a, a demo website that we leverage, leverage to show and showcase our our capabilities, and you'll see here that there are regions or slots that are allocated for personalization. Uh, there are five regions starting from the top left. Uh, loyalty offers can be presented uh, in the banner. Uh, there's also a section for site category affinity that means based on the browse behavior of the individual during the session, um, this area will be personalized based on uh, how often someone has viewed, for example, running shoes or uh, running related items. On the right-hand side to that, the homepage hero is being um, uh, personalized based on the last category, so not how often something was viewed, but uh, what was the last item. Then if we move towards the lower left, we can see there's a goal-driven uh, smart asset. That means that we're able to drive an ABN test and, and leverage machine learning to figure out you know, what's most appealing, what's you know, getting the most traction. Uh, and then finally, on the lower right-hand side, there's a geo-based offer that's personalized based on the user's uh, location. So it's leveraging the browser um, um, location, latitude, longitude, so provided that the user has accepted that, that capability on the browser, we're able to then leverage that geolocation to personalize the offer. So when we navigate to the next slide here, we can see uh, this is a fully uh, built out uh, personalized experience of an individual, uh, someone that has, uh, for example, viewed um, ski related items. Uh, we can see that uh, on, on the image uh, to, uh, on the left uh, next to the hero image. And of course the hero image is showing a, a skier. Uh, so that image is being personalized based on the last category uh, that, that was viewed. Uh, and then there's the ABN test in the lower left, but uh, pay attention to the uh, lower right image. This is the personalization based on the user's uh, geography. So this is a this is an example where we're we're leveraging the input in this case the latitude longitude to then drive a real time offer. In this case, uh, it's inviting me to uh, to visit the uh, a store uh, because there's a demo day going on. So this is very relevant uh, based on the user's um, demographic and, and geographic information. So these are examples now uh, from a consumer experience side. When we uh, look at next, on the next slide, we're gonna look at behind the scenes or behind the covers in terms of how the software and how the application enables this type of marketing. So it's still important to allow marketing uh, teams to, to build campaigns based on their cadence. 
Uh, but what we're ad advocating is to also um, complement the marketing calendar with more trigger-based and more journey-based uh, uh, type of experiences that are more relevant. And so that this is the idea then to leverage um, uh, beyond, for example, the um, the the uh, the screenshot we see here is a traditional newsletter campaign that has a star trigger, the audience, and then the actual email with the newsletter. We we want to really uh, move beyond this and um, move towards a world where things happen more based on the user's input. For example, someone signing up. Uh, for the first time. So let's go ahead and take a look at a journey here as an example. So someone that's, that's um, you know, signing up for the first time, we can create a, a journey around that experience, starting with a trigger, so based on someone signing up, and uh, then selecting the audience. Uh, the next step here is then to determine the best channel. In this case, we see the email channel being leveraged, SMS, uh, app pushes, direct mail and social, uh, just as examples, these, these are definitely not all the channels, but some of the power channels that are being leveraged by marketers today. Then what we see here in this flow, in this journey is a wait period uh, where we're allowing data to come back. And so we're, we're leveraging in this, uh, in this example, data uh, that's coming back to us in this case, uh, based on clicks or opens. And we can leverage that to branch the journey based on the user's action if they've engaged or opened and clicked. We can take them down the, the top path uh, where we then personalize the next message uh, with the next best offer, uh, wait another period um, and see what happens, and then uh, react based on the engagement or non-engagement. Versus on the lower flow, we can see that uh, there's a slightly different tack, especially towards the end of that journey, uh, where we can, for example, engage uh, other channels that may be more costly, but may be important because at that point uh, in, in the lower right, the person hasn't engaged in the email, so it might be time to try a different channel. Okay, so so all these experience require data, and that's that's really the the point that we want to take away from here is that um, you know, data is, is driving these journeys. So when we take a look at the next slide, this then covers the, the importance of a, a centralized uh, brain, if you will, or a, a hub that is able to not only um, consolidate all the data, but is actually able to react to any uh, stimulus, to any trigger on the website or in the app. Uh, so the idea is to, um, bring all the channels together and control them with a, a, a single uh, intelligent orchestration uh, capability. Uh, so regardless of the channel that the, the uh, consumer is leveraging, whether that's email or web or actually in-store, we're collecting that data uh, using our connectors and APIs uh, that we've uh, built and furnished to our customers. So this gives us a very agile way to, um, you know, deal with new technologies such as uh, social media, uh, as well as other traditional channels, including email and web. Uh, but the idea is to then also have all of this orchestration be very uh, precise, and that requires a, a unified contact history model. It also uh, re requires everything to be in a closed loop fashion. So as we're sending out campaigns, uh, we're not only collecting what was sent out uh, for the consumer and the customer, but we're also collecting data that's coming back, such as the opens and the clicks. And then uh, at the bottom, you know, everything has to really happen at the customer uh, cadence, and that, that requires uh, both batch, you know, traditional approach to marketing, as well as real-time uh, capabilities. And then finally, um, you know, modern CDPs really allow you to fuse together the, um, the data as well as then also driving the experience. So modern CDPs uh, aren't just pushing out data, but they're actually handling the experience of the user regardless of what channel they're inter uh, interfacing with you. Uh, and, then, and, and lastly, uh, my last point is that you also, uh, there's a great need to apply po company policies, including privacy policies, uh, as well as also leveraging customer preferences, such as frequency preferences, um, you know, allowing the consumer to dictate how often they're, they're, uh, they're communicated with. 
uh, in what channel they're communicated with and how many messages uh, they're getting. So all of that requires the ability to handle policies on top of the ability to manage all these channels. Thanks, RF. Uh, I just had a couple of follow-up questions for you, then we get to some audience questions in a few minutes here. Um, but if you go back a slide to that journey that you were showing us, you mentioned some of the data triggers that are related to this journey, but where either expanding on that or where does machine learning fit in to the, you know, the orchestrated customer journey? Sure, yes. Automated uh, machine learning is playing a, a large role uh, more and more every day. Um, it's, it's a really good method to, to leverage the data uh, very quickly and, and very, um, very precisely. So the machine learning can be applied, and we're seeing that applied to the audience selection. So, so the audience itself uh, can leverage machine learning. What, what's the best audience? And letting the model decide, you know, what the best audience is to, to message. Um, machine learning can also be used in terms of determining the best channel for that individual. So it can, it can drill down into the individual uh, individual's um, behavior and figure out what's the best channel. Uh, machine learning can be used to drive the offer or the content, you know, what's the best offer or what's the next best action that we want uh, the consumer to take, uh, as well as also what's the best time, what's the best time of the day, or what's the best um, day of the week um, that we can send those offers. So, so machine learning can really complement and, and help marketers in, in all those areas. Great, thanks. And it seems like marketers need the tools to do the you know simple journeys simply, which you had a slide on, but as well as complex journeys in a simple way. And how often are marketers pushing the boundaries in terms of innovating their customer experiences in new ways? Yeah, so marketers are always experiment with, experimenting with um, customer experience. So they need a, a really good approach to A-B testing that includes the ability to define and test the best channels uh, to, to message in the best content, the best model of analytics and machine learning, um, the best triggers for the best time. So there's, there's really a, a, a whole um, array of uh, different uh, items that can be tested, and marketers are always trying to achieve the best results and figuring out you know, where can we uh, move the levers to drive the best outcome. Great. And maybe perhaps closer to the customer experience a little bit. What are the where are marketers stretching the envelope um, in terms of personalization? Right. So in terms of personalization, the um, the um, marketers are leveraging um, data uh, and analytics uh, more and more. Uh, and, and the easier it is to bring all of the, the integrated data and analytics and orchestration together, uh, the finer the segments can be, uh, it's much easier to handle the content uh, when everything is in one place. Uh, it also reduces the, um, uh, the, the, the friction uh, that the consumer may experience. And we, we talked about a number of times about you know, not sending an offer for an item that was just purchased. Uh, so, so really the idea is to then uh, reduce also human error uh, by, by centralizing uh, all of the, um, the touch points and controlling them from one brain, uh, which is then going to increase the customer value. Great. Thank you. Yeah, things like yeah, I think geofencing and open time emails, there's a lot of really interesting things marketers could be doing uh, with, with all these capabilities. So appreciate that. Um, I've got just a few uh, additional slides, and we'll do turn over to you, Chris, for any uh, questions and wrap up. I just wanted to, you know, reflect on the perfect experiences are built on great capabilities. They're also built on great teams. So you're bringing the teams. Uh, you've got the power to really make this happen, and we recognize that we have to figure out a way to make this work in your organization. Um, and part of that is we've architected our solution, and I encourage you to look for solutions that are really architected around an open garden environment. So you can, in essence, use any channel, data, or cloud. You know, our MarTech stacks are becoming more and more complex. Uh, these are all the connectors we're managing, whether they're data connectors or social connectors or ad tech, CRM providers, SMS, um, you know, IoT devices, e-commerce engines. There's a lot to be managed, and we're really the, the, the single point of control over data and operations that you talked about, RF, is really comes together here. You've got to leverage your existing technology. Uh, you've got to do it in ways um, that 
uh, or future-proof you so that if the next new social network comes on or some other engagement channel or IoT device, you can easily plug that in. And you also obviously need to take advantage of today's cloud technology. Um, ultimately, be, make sure that you can port to any cloud, whether it's Amazon, AWS, or Azure, or Google, or if you've got a private cloud for security purposes, you want to run some of this software behind your firewalls because you don't want the data to leave it. That's becoming a more and more important consideration as people are really do advanced personalization. Um, so this is how, you know, I th hopefully you got some value today in understanding how we render the data more valuable, actionable, profitable, and how to connect it to deliver those perfect experiences and ultimately outcomes. And we think we brought together some unified technology that delivers uncommon outcomes of potentially being the top revenue platform, revenue generating platform in your organization. And no matter how you might describe what perfect looks like for you or what you would desire to go from your point A to point B, um, we'd be happy to talk to you and you supply the dream, we can handle the details. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to you, Chris. That sounds great. A terrific presentation, John, and everyone. Well, we do have some great questions from our audience. Uh, if we don't get to your questions, as time permits, we'll definitely follow up afterwards offline. Um, Steve, this first question is to you, uh, and it, it deals with, you know, what they call the death of cookies. Knowing there is a future without cookies, uh, our attendee asks, how can we prepare the way we serve a personalized customer experience? Steve, what do you think? So that's a great question. To, to, I'd remind everybody that what we're talking about here is third-party cookies, because first-party cookies are not going to go away. Third-party cookies were used for stickiness in advertisements and in advertising tech and for attribution. But consumers, as, as we talked about, get pretty annoyed by being followed around by outdated or irrelevant offers. And the thing that we need to emphasize is the relationship between the consumer and the brand or the store. Uh, with a strong emphasis on first-party data, consumer opt-in shifts the conversation to a value or uh, to a uh, conversation around value exchange. Consumers will willingly share their data in exchange for a frictionless and relevant experience, especially if you offer to protect it. So things like preference centers, uh, proper opt-in requirements, uh, and a demonstration that you understand who they are uh, really require that marketers reimagine CX in terms of the consumer's desires and limits, the consumer looking in rather than the brand looking out, looking to do what the brand wants to do. Got it. Um, Bill, our next question is for you. One of our attendees uh, identifies himself as a marketer, obviously, and uh, he wants to know uh, if he needs to do um, everything with machine learning or can he just be selective and, and, and say, uh, let's say just do segmentation or just do predictions or take it in an ad hoc modular way. What do you think, Bill? Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to do everything in the book. But these are tools, and you can use whatever tool that you want to to do as many things as you'd like to have done. We see a lot of the clients that have not uh, really done much in the line of machine learning start very, very simply in the old uh, crawl, walk, run approach. They start with maybe, you know, let's get a product recommender that's actually much more personalized than what they're doing first. And then after they've got that, then they can add segmentation and maybe even, you know, predict revenue and things like that. So, again, you don't have to do everything at once, and probably it's not even the best idea to do everything at once. That, with that being said, too, is that if you are advanced in some machine learning and you just want to do some automation of it, then you can actually do the replacement of that as you need to do in terms of, you know, here's a systemic suite of tools that automates it for you. You can say, okay, well, I'm going to take my current modeling and drop it into here, and I'm going to do my product recommendation, drop it into there, and automate the entire process as you want to. But certainly, if you're starting out, you, don't, you certainly don't have to do anything um, other than the simple stuff to start with. Sounds great. Now, you know, uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to pose one more question to, um, uh, to our ref because it actually is a segue from what Bill had just mentioned. One of our attendees asks, what can I do to help my company catch up? We're a little bit behind. This seems like a very intensive process. How do we catch up with the others and my competitors in providing real-time customer experiences? Uh, our ref, can you answer that uh, qu uh, quickly and briefly? 
Yes, I can. So we recommend the crawl, walk, run approach, uh, you know, echoing, um, you know, the, the sentiment, you know, we don't want to boil the ocean. So the, the idea is that uh, marketers can start with, uh, you know, a small, you know, sm uh, the crawl approach, meaning that they can take a, uh, a landing page and, um, and, and um, you know, personalize that landing page and then uh, do some A-B testing around the personalization of that uh, landing page using, for example, Google Analytics or your favorite analytics tool. Or it could be a, a section on the website. It could be uh, something like a small section on the web, uh, the home page that they can personalize. So the idea is to smart, uh, start small, you track it, you track the results, uh, and then you get company buy-in, meaning that you, you share the findings that personalization, for example, does work. Uh, and then you come up with a plan in terms of a roadmap of how to build up uh, and, and build out your, your personalization approach that can, uh, you know, start at the website and then maybe include other channels, including email. And if you have an app, uh, it, can, it can transition to that. So crawl, walk, run, start small, get some successes, and then get company buy-in and move on from there. Sounds great. Well, we've reached the end of our time. Thanks to everyone for attending AdAge's custom webcast sponsored by Redpoint Global. Now, a couple of our attendees had asked this question. Can you view and listen to this presentation on demand using, well, you can. You can use the same link you used to attend today, and you'll receive an email as soon as the archive is ready. So you can download it, share with your colleagues and, uh, and uh, your other partners in the office, or <laughs> if they're not in the office, uh, via email. So on behalf of our guests, John Nash, Steve Zisk, Bill Porto, and Aref Narudi, from Redpoint Global, thanks so much for your time. Have a great and prosperous day.